Warren Black, I am the morning host with All Classical Portland. That's very nice. Thank you very much. I take it you listen to classical radio then? All right. Very nice. Well, we have a, a treat tonight. Um, a world premiere is happening tonight. And it involves uh, the two gentlemen here who are on stage with me. Uh, cellist, Johannes Moser. Good evening. And composer, Robin Holloway. So, um, I guess we would start by talking about uh, your early musical influences. Um, how did music come into both of your lives? I, was, I guess start with Johannes. Sure. I, I'm not sure that music came into my life, but, but I sort of came into music's life uh, by my, both of my parents being musicians. Um, and their parents had been musicians, and their parents had been musicians, so kind of didn't really have a cho choice to be a lawyer in that, that point. <laughs> Although I did try my best at escaping <laughs> my fate and was unsuccessful, and here we are today. Um, and I, you know, I started like a lot of kids with, with early musical education, banging on drums and pots, and then started out on the violin, and at some point the family decided that we had enough suffered. Uh, and that I should no, no longer make noises of dying cats. And um, moved on to the cello, which um, was my dad's instrument. And um, now, thinking of today, I started fairly early on in my education to work with composers. And um, I was always fascinated by that process that there is a blank page, and then at some point there something on there and then you have to transform what is on the page and bring it into life and um, that process uh, fascinates me until today because it's not just you know transforming notes into the right pitches but it's actually to um, find out what kind of living creature can that be that is actually on the page and and um, yeah we had a performance of of the piece yesterday and we're going to have one again today, and the wonderful thing about having four concerts in the beginning of bringing a piece to life is that you see that this is not a birth of, of one performance, but it actually goes through many iterations, and, and this morning we had some communication, and Robin generously slipped the piece of paper under my door, <laughs> literally, with some, uh, some comments, which, I, which I'm very grateful for, and we are developing the piece as, as we go, and, and that is sort of the salt of life for me when it, it comes to, to new music. So, Robin, tell us just a, a, a little presses on you. Yes, I'll add to that, but, but let me just add in a moment. Bring up just, my is, is this all right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, th let me just add to, to what Johannes has just said. The, the, uh, every performance of a piece of music is a is an eternal triangle between composer, performer, and composer, performer, and listener. The, you know, the, 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 every side of that triangle is essential to every performance of every piece of music. It can sometimes be forgotten. Sometimes the performer wins, sometimes the composer wins, sometimes the audience wins. But that's wrong. It should be a total equality between those three indispensable sides. Now, you asked me about my first experience of music. Well, um, my parents said that when I was an infant, I responded ardently to every musical sound in the house or in the street or around the place. A, a bit later, I remember, um, this will age me for you all, um, this was pre LP or CD, we still had 78 RPM gramophone records. It is, I'm talking about the late 1940s, the early 50s when I was a little kid, and our precious handful of 78s. Do you does anyone here remember 78s? <laughs> and then winding down in pitch and in volume towards the end of every side, unless you wound it up quickly to get it back to 78. 
And I just adored the records that we had, a little handful of precious records, a few Schubert songs, a bit of Bach on the harpsichord, van der Landowska, um, some numbers from the magic flute, a, and a, a Purcell trumpet tune, things like that. I, I adored these. And I used to run around the back garden of our house in South London, pretending to be a 78 record, singing the tune, running in circle, ever diminishing circles, reaching the end of the tune by the middle of the garden. <laughs> so that's my musical education. Ah, that's wonderful. Um, so tell us about how, I'm, I'm really curious to know how the process works when you write a piece like this for someone like Johannes. What's, um, where, where, where do you even begin, I guess? Well, where I began um, was the, the pleasure of getting a commission to write a cello concerto, which I'd long wanted to write, but at last it was realistic, a real person, a real orchestra, a real place um, for this, for this um, projected piece of music. And um, I, d I just began by writing many, many fragments of disconnected music, always with the cello as the principal voice. It was focused upon a cello solo um, with some kind of accompaniment, some kind of different character, but there was no overall architecture or shape or receptacle into which to put all this material. And I had problems with that rather later. I just didn't know what journey to take or what, what receptacle could receive all these different ingredients. And then gradually that came last. Um, but when it came, there was plenty of material to fill up that shape. So the final composition was very fluent and rapid, but it had been before that problematic and difficult. And I think you'll perhaps hear the result of that process, the, up, the backwards process this evening, because what, what the concerto offers is not a big tr a journey in one or two or three shapes, but lots and lots of different characters and materials in succession. So it's a kind of, um, what's that Danish term for that dish? Smuggersbrod. Smorgasbord. A smorgasbord, yes. Yeah. Many, many, many flavors laid ah. out on a space. The space is not the point. The point is different characters, different flavors, one after the other, and eventually that makes the total shape. So what's the process? I was wondering two things. How long a process was this from commissioning? And what kind of interplay do you have between the two of you? I well, I mean, I lost the sense of time in the last two years, <laughs> so I have no idea. It, if you tell me it took one year or if it took 10 years, it's all the same for me at this point. Um, but we did have this concerto, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, planned for October of 21. Yes, yeah. Is that right? Yes. Or 20, or for 20. 20. 20, 20. Yeah. yeah, see, there you go. I no idea when that was. Mm. Um, and so, so, so the process is, is that um, Robin is, is very, very, very honorable, and, and a really a big ex um, exception is that he finishes pieces in time. <laughs> um, because most of the concerti and, and um, you know, also smaller chamber pieces that I've commissioned, uh, they still had wet ink <laughs> um, or a wet fax paper <laughs> back in the day. Um, wet thoughts. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that for sure. That for sure. <laughs> and um, so this piece has been sitting at my home for, for quite a while. Um, and then when this date firmed up and it was actually certain that um, we would perform here, um, I started learning it and I... Uh, I wanted to travel to London, and for for unfortunate reasons, due to our political makeup at the moment, um, couldn't travel. And so um, I sent him videos, and he sent me back some comments, and that's how we, you know, gave gave uh, gave some shape to to the to my part.
but of course, my part is only a tiny piece of the puzzle. Um, it is all about the communication between myself and different parts of the orchestra. And so really that became only apparent in the first rehearsals that we had just now. And um, of course you can, you can see things in the score and you can analyze it and you can try to imagine it. But when you're actually on stage, that, that is when you start to, to engage in the communication, to engage in the actual conversation that such a piece offers. Whereas before it's just like reading a play from from a book. Yes. yes. I have to say that um, Johannes' videos of himself trying out my con the solo part in my concerto were completely enchanting because you, you could see his entire face. He <laughs> didn't, didn't need to put on a mask to, se to, to send a video by email. But alas, we've all, we've all got to disguise our expressions, which sometimes for a performing musician is extremely important. I mean, the play of face, well, we all know that, but in, in just in con ordinary conversation, but the play of expression as musicians communicate while they're playing together can be very vivid and very important to the shaping of a phrase or the, the continuation of a, a mood. So what else was I supposed to say? <laughs> no, no, that, 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 that hits it on, on the head. It's, it's very strange because to your point, um, when, when I was playing the general rehearsal and I was looking at uh, our wonderful conductor, Yon Sun Kim, um, just to get a certain, you know, impulse from her. She later on took me aside and was like, what, I was doing something wrong? Because she couldn't read my expression in the face, right? Yeah. I was just looking with big googly eyes. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, uh, yes. I, I told her that everything's yes. fine. Yes, yes. But actually, I think you will find that despite these impediments, um, there is considerable communication between the soloist and the orchestra in just this point of um, expression and characterization. And that's very important because my piece has many, many changes of mood. Um, there are only four movements. They're not separate, they're continuous. You might not get the breaks in the movements. That's not the point so much as the changes all the time of mood, emotion, temper, temperament um, be between all the way from melancholy, elegiac, thought, meditative, thoughtful, woeful, depressed, to exuberant and funny and comical and satirical. A wide range of um, emotion, not necessarily in the usual kind of order and always intercut with each other, but always needing immediate response between the soloist and the accompanying orchestra. Interesting, uh, when I began to watch the performance rather than watching the score, as in the early rehearsals, I saw so often large sections of the orchestra were not playing for a long time. I thought, well, that seems a bit wasteful. They're all being paid. Why shouldn't they be playing? But, but in fact, it's quite deliberate. The score is very spare. Johannes, the, the protagonist, is playing almost all the time, but the orchestra is often sectional. He's accompanied only by a couple of bassoons, a couple of clarinets, maybe the whole strings for a bit, then a few strings, then a few woodwinds again, then a bit of brass, one favorite place, which I hope you'll all like, is accompanied for some time only by two trumpets. There's another bit where he's only got celesta and harp. But uh, the, the, so the, there's a um, great sparingness with the use of the full orchestra in order to have conversations and exchanges and collaborations of a chamber music kind almost the whole way through the piece. I guess it's also probably nice since, Johannes, you've spent so much time here. You were the artist in residence here for a time, and you played with the Oregon Symphony. It must be nice to come in and have these moments of interplay with 
people you know. Absolutely. And um, I don't know if you remember, some of you might have been at the last performance that I, that I gave here, which was the Lutoslavsky Cello Concerto, which is a piece where the cello is fighting the orchestra, actually, <laughs> and eventually gets smashed by it. <laughs> and I'm glad that we are engaging in a different kind of conversation uh, this week, yes, yes, yes. which is far more amicable, uh, I would say, at times. Uh, as you say, satirical and, 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 and funny, but, but, uh, but there are no casualties, no I casual think. No, no, casualties. no, no casualties, which is... And eventual, communica eventual joinings up. Yes. When, when the orchestra, now and again, the orchestra is permitted to play all together sometimes even with the cello soloist as well. But these are meetings. Um, uh, they're, not, they're not sort of um, fake peace deals after some disastrous war. They are they're, they're genuine, pacific um, reciprocation of the individual person and the body of players who's be, who've been his friends throughout. I know Johannes needs to go back and warm up, but you mentioned his videos. I don't know if anybody follows Johannes on social medias, but the videos are are a delight. And your video about your your video summary of Scheherazade tonight is so good. I don't know if you can like bust that out again. It's oh. great. It's like 15, 15 seconds. The whole no, piece. I, I invite all of you to to <laughs> check out my social media for that. Um, I was asked by. This is the thing, like when you start with videos, you get asked to do more videos. Um, but yeah, we were trying to tell the story of Sherazat in 20 seconds. And so go check it out, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll have to go warm up. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank Johannes you, Johannes Moser. Right. Mm -hmm. well, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, Robin, how about, about how your piece fits into the, uh, the overall program tonight. I know, um, and I guess I'm looking forward to this because you're, you've been teaching music at Cambridge for many years, right? Yes, I've also been retired for many years. Oh, well, you yeah. <laughs> know. Once there, it's still there, though. Mm. So, yeah, so I'm curious to know how we have pieces that are very much about setting a scene and telling story. And you, yours, from what I gather, tells a sort of a story without a specific story being told, but there's a hero at least. Well, yes. I, I, um, I, of course, I had no idea when writing this piece what the program was going to be. But it fit... Is this all right? I see, I see some people holding hands up. No, no, tilt it back. Tilt it back toward you. There we go. There you go. Is that better? Is that better? Sorry, yeah. sorry. I don't like these things. I, I, I prefer to be sucking a lollipop. Than <laughs> no, no, I had no idea, of course, that what the program was going to be, but it actually fits quite interestingly. I mean, the Rimsky Scheherazade, of course, tells stories in a very generalized kind of way, in, in an idiom of a kind of, what shall we say, kitsch orientalism of tr of tremendous. Uh, verve and success. The Duca is extremely specific. It tells one story in great detail and every event and the two characters involved are sharply etched in front of you. It. It's the opposite of the Rimsky. Rimsky's general, the Duca is particular. My thing is neither. It's not a narrative. There's no story. Um, but it fits interestingly between the two famous um, na narrative works which surround it. There's no narrative, there's n but every concerto has a protagonist. That's the nature of the genre. There's a protagonist set against a crowd, um, whether set amicably or inimically, or a mixture of both. They've got to collaborate in order to make the piece of music that makes a concerto. That's what it's all about. And so mine, the, 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 the cello is the protagonist. I've said there's a great variety of moods and um, temp speeds and characters. They're not characters like the sorcerer or his apprentice or Scheherazade and, her, and, the, and the various people in the Rimsky. 
They're not characters in a story, but they're, they're characteristics, melancholy, or nostalgia, or wistfulness, or exuberance, or aggression, or satire, or uh, and, uh, there is all kinds of other things. I don't want to name them because I don't want to be so specific, but you'll get the sense that there's lots and lots of people in that solo part. They're not telling a story, they're just moods that we all have intermittently or um, sometimes simultaneously even, but certainly adjacent. And so it fits, sorry, it fits quite well into the scheme which I knew nothing about between the two famous um, storytelling pieces that surround it. So um, I know you've written other concertos. Um, is this the first cello concerto? I know the violin concerto. I was listening to your horn concerto this afternoon. I, I, I love writing con concerti for just the reasons I've been giving. It's, you know, it, it, it celebrates a, a particular instrument with that instrument's particular qualities. It's, it's timbre, it's character, it's range, it's sonority, it's everything about it. Whether it's a tuba or a, or a flute or a cello or a, or a harp, you know, not all, for all of which I've written concertos. It, it be, it's up to the composer to find the, the material and the shape that will enhance and display that particular characteristic of that particular instrument. But um, I, I, can't, I can't think of an answer beyond that. I, I, you know, I, I just love doing that. Do you spend a lot of time researching a particular instrument when you're oh, no. setting about this? You or don't or have you to just research an instrument, you just write for it. Come on. You know, <laughs> we, we, we all know what a cello sounds like. I, I couldn't play the cello. To, I, I couldn't get three decent sounding notes out of a cello myself. But I know exactly what a cello sounds like. I know the technique, I know the tuning. I know the, the literature of the cello. I love, I couldn't make a, 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 I couldn't make a, but I've written concertos for both because we all know the instrument. We love its particular nature. You're writing for that. If there are technical problems, I always ask the player, let me know, is this impractical? Is this awkward? Is this impossible? And I will adjust accordingly. But I'm not going to be limited by, by the fact that I can't play the thing. You, 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 no one would ever write a note of music. That's true. Except mm -hmm. Hindemith, who learnt all the instruments. <laughs> but look, he's a boring composer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and is it usually, uh, are you, in the case of a concerto, an individual player, does that have? Uh, you know, one chalice versus another, or...? That's, uh, it's always a thrill to be asked to write for an individual player, but most of my concerti have, not, have been written without an individual in mind. I've got the instrument in mind. And um, uh, the only exception I can think of that really is a, a, a strong exception was a tuba concerto I wrote for the wonderful principal tuba player of the San Francisco Orchestra down, you know, down, down in, for me, your, your same, part of the, same part of the world. And I heard this player in an orchestral work of mine, where, which happened to have a big tuba solo. I thought, this is the finest tuba playing I've ever heard. I would like to write this player a concerto. And a few years later, that, I mentioned the, the dream, and a few days later, the dream came true. And that was, I had to collaborate with him because the instrument is so, you all know the tuba. It's, you know, it, it, it's enormous. It's, you could almost set up house in it with your, with your family. You know, I just had to ask about the technique. I knew what it sounded like. I loved the instrument, but the technical, I knew the lowest note and the highest note, things like that, but some of the, practical limitations I had to 
collaborate on. The main thing he said was give it lots of breaths. The cello, you'll find Johannes is playing almost continuously because he doesn't have to breathe in order to play. But a wind instrument, a brass instrument, have to breathe. A tuba has got the biggest breath requirements of all because it's the biggest instrument. So I just, even conceiving long melodic phrases, I had to ha articulate them with gaps, with breathing points, with punctuation, like I'm talking now, to make it possible physically for the player. And then he could indeed give an impression of a huge span of music because it was articulated into grammar points where he could actually go <gasps> like that suddenly. It's been exciting too to work with uh, a cellist as great as Johannes is, just to know that you could do anything, you could give him anything, I would think. Yes, but he couldn't be a tuba. <laughs> and it's got to be a cello, you know. It, it, it's true. It's got, the, 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 the nature of the instrument has always got to be respected and loved and, and used. All right, well, Robin Holloway, I'm Warren Black. You are in for a treat tonight. Thanks again for coming and enjoy the show. Thank you, sir. Thank you.